empoderamento feminino através de novas energias e novas infraestruturas. Com vocês, Sharon McPherson. Did you like the video? <laughs> yes. <Did> you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. I love your outfits. <laughs> Oi, <laughs> campus party. <laughs> it's good to be here in Rondonia. And I just want to tell you that if I ever get to come back to campus party in Brazil, the next time I'm going to follow Portuguese, okay? <laughs> okay, um, I have flown for 24 hours to be here with you, sorry, can, come, can you come this way? So if I have to sit down from time to time, I will. I want to have a talk that's engaging and one that's not so formal, and I wanted to also say to you that I am going to talk about technology and some of the emerging technologies that are coming out of Africa, because that's what I promised to talk about. But one of the things that I always do is I try to make sure that um, I pray before I talk and that I come to you with a message that is coming not just from my head, but also from my heart. Okay? So that means that sometimes I plan to talk about something, but then later um, that changes. And that happened today. So I'm going to talk about technology, but one of the things that I'm also going to talk about is I'm going to talk about bridges. Um, because the more that I work with technologists, the more time I spend with amazing people from all over the world who are involved in all the areas of technology, the more that I realize that the real frontier, the real final frontier, that emerging frontier that we need to be talking about really is the frontier that's in here. It's a frontier that's really about human consciousness. And it doesn't matter what area of technology that you're involved in, if this isn't a frontier that you're concerned about, then we need to talk, okay? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. So who I, how did I get here? What am I doing? So, um, you know my name, but you probably don't know my story. And so I wanted to take a minute before I started talking about technology and women in technology and all the stuff we'll talk about. And I wanted to just tell you a little bit about myself because I think it's important that you understand how I got here today, right? So. One of the things that I do is I run the Center for Disruptive Technologies, which is based in Johannesburg, South Africa. CDT is a network orchestrator. We have thousands of really disruptive ideators on one platform that we're building. And the idea is to be able to take people like you and to put you onto projects, to have you brainstorming with corporate CEOs, having you collaborate together and figure out how are you going to take your skills, your knowledge, your expertise, your projects, and put them to work serving somebody to make a difference and to make money. So that's what the Center for Disruptive Tech is all about. Um, like I said, we are Pan-African. We're not just in South Africa. So South Africa is my home. Um, it's my adopted home. I was born in America, but North America. Um, and I've lived in Africa for the last 20 years. How many of you have heard of Singularity University? Few? I'm also a member of the faculty of Singularity University, which is based in Silicon Valley. So I spend a lot of time going back and forth between Africa and uh, California, and we'll come back to that. So just to go back, so that's what CDT is doing. So before I get to Bridges, I wanted to take a minute and I wanted to just tell you a little bit about myself. Is that okay? Okay. So it is really unlikely that a person like me from my background 
would be here today talking to you about technology. Um, I was born in the United States and my parents were very poor. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money. My parents were educators and they were civil rights activists. I'm the youngest of eight. I have eight siblings. And when I was about 14 years old, my parents came to me and they told me that they didn't have enough money left to um, send me to university. So that said, I probably wasn't planned, but that's okay, I was loved, right? <laughs> so they said, you know, if you're gonna go to university, you need to really work hard because you're gonna need a scholarship. And I'm here to tell you that even though I'm tall and I'm black, I don't play basketball, okay? So I had to actually like figure out how was I gonna get my university paid for. So that's important because there aren't enough people who look like me, who come from my background, who are involved with technology. And that's a problem because algorithms don't write themselves, right? And so the more that we become reliant on technology, the more important it is that there be diversity in technology, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the smart thing to do. So how does a person who comes from my background get to go to Singularity University, I live in Africa, I travel the world, I've raised hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in tech startups, um, I've created thousands of jobs with the various things that I do, how did I go from there to here? And so I wanted to weave that into my talk because I've had the opportunity to walk around Rondania. I've spent the day doing that. And I think that there are a lot of young people in Rondania who maybe they have a background like my background. And so I didn't want to come here, you know, jet in here like some you know, a rich California lady who's gonna talk to you about her cool tech stuff. I want to come here and have this kind of conversation because for me, that's what it's all about. So I left my job on Wall Street. I moved to Africa because I knew that my activities weren't sustainable. So my background is really in banking and in law. So how did I get into technology? I got into technology because one of the gifts that I have is to see where the market is going. Where do you invest? What's gonna happen next? That's what I'm good at doing. And I'm here to tell you that we need to build better bridges between Brazil and Africa because Africa is what's happening next. And I'm gonna give you a little quiz to ask you what you really know about Africa, what you really think you know. Because one of the things that I've also learned is that we have to unlearn some things about each other. So you see me, and do you see a person who has a doctorate's degree from Columbia University? Probably not, but I do. Do you see a person who has channeled hundreds of millions of dollars into tech startups? Probably not, but I do. Do you see a person who has a network that is capable of impacting. We impacted a million people last year. We counted them in terms of jobs that we created, in terms of wealth that we created, in terms of communities that we impact. I don't think that everything that matters in life can be counted, but I do believe it's important for us to count what we can. So we count our impact. So I want you to ask yourself, when you see me, what do you see? so that you can start to unlearn what you think about me, what you think about yourselves, because we all have the power to impact. We all have the power to change our environments and our communities. So what I wanna do tonight is I wanna set the tone for Campus Party Rondonia. I want you to leave this talk tonight having a different mindset about the experiences that you're gonna have during this campus party. Are you down for that? You open? Okay, good. So, why bridges? First of all, anybody recognize that bridge? 
Yeah? You can yell during my talk. You don't have to just be quiet and be polite. You can just like yell out if you think you know something. What bridge is that? San Francisco Bridge. So why is this woman who's involved in tech, and I'll tell you more about how I got to tech, why is she here talking to us about bridges? I'm talking to you about bridges because bridges connect things. And part of what we're going to need to do as people who are interested in technology is we're going to have to figure out how do we better connect things? How do we build connections between men and women who are in technology? Between black people and white people and pink people and green people? How do we build bridges between the rich and the poor? Between the people who don't know anything about technology and the people who are experts? So I got into technology because I was able to unlearn some things I thought I knew, see where the future was going. And when I was at Singularity University, I said to Peter Diamandi, so they invited me to Singularity University because I started one of the first women-focused funds in Africa. And we raised about $50 million to invest in women-owned and operated businesses. And they invited me to Singularity University because I was interested in smart cities and the participation of women in gender and infrastructure because your infrastructure is really important in terms of how you move along in life. And so when I was there, I said to Peter, uh, who is also the founder of the X Prize, many of you may know him, I said, Peter, I don't have a technical background. I'm not a physicist. At the time, I didn't know how to code. You know, um, I'm not an engineer. How am I going to make a difference at Singularity University? How am I going to impact the lives of a billion people? And he said, Sharon, you don't need to be an engineer. You just need to hire the engineers. And I said, OK. <laughs> I think I can do that. <laughs> and so today, um, I don't spend a lot of time coding. I hire people who code for me, OK? All right, so why bridges? Bridges because we need to understand one another. We need to connect. If that's what, if we're going to get to where we want to be in the future, what's going to happen after the age of disruption? So now we're in the age of disruption. We're in this thing that Professor Schwab, who founded the World Economic Forum, calls the fourth industrial revolution. So we're in that now. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. But what's going to come out of that fourth industrial revolution is the age of connectedness. The internet of things doesn't just connect things to things or people to things. The internet also connects, the internet of things also can connect people to people. So as you're sitting here and you're listening to this talk, I want you to ask yourself, who are you, why are you here, and what kind of people do we want to be connecting and why, right? So this is one of my favorite bridges. It's beautiful. I'm going to show you a few iconic bridges because I just think that they're absolutely beautiful. But as you're looking at these pictures of bridges, I want you to be asking yourself, what kind of bridge are you building with your technology? And technology isn't just about what's, what we're doing with computers, right? You have technology. One of the most sophisticated machines on the planet is the human brain, right? So what are you doing with your own technology and what kind of bridges are you building? This is built, this bridge is called the Helix um, and it's located in Singapore. One of the great things about bridges that are different from other types of architectural structures is that anybody can access a bridge, right? So it's not just about an architectural feat or great engineering or beautiful design, but bridges are accessible by everyone. Anyone can cross a bridge. So this bridge is called the Seri Wawasan, and it's in Indonesia. 
Anybody recognize this one? No? Ponta de la Mujer is in Buenos Aires. Okay? Yeah? Anybody recognize this bridge? The Sheikh Zayed Bridge in Dubai. Isn't it interesting how the bridges that we build reflect our culture? They reflect us as people. But each bridge is doing the same thing. It's connecting two points. It's utilitarian, but it's also beautiful, right? So uh, this is a bridge uh, that's located in Amsterdam. And I love the way the two um, lanes merge into one. This is one of my favorite bridges. This is the Nelson Mandela Bridge in South Africa, my adopted country. Uh, this this, this uh, year is the 100th uh, year anniversary. Mandela would be 100 if he lived today. And I just came from the BRICS summit. The BRICS is obviously Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And the only thing they wanted to talk about at the BRICS summit was technology and disruption. And I was sitting there the whole time asking myself, but what are we doing to build bridges between the BRICS countries? How does a person who's sitting here in this room who wants to come and partner with me in South Africa and get involved with some of the things that I'm doing in South Africa, how do you do that? What are the bridges that are available for that? How are we staying connected? What are we using to collaborate, to co-create, right? Now, surely you recognize this bridge. No? Well, I'm not going to tell you where this, what the name of this bridge is. That's your homework. But this bridge is in Brazil. And it's beautiful. OK? So give yourselves a round of applause for building a great bridge. Woo hoo! <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's your bridge. So let's talk a little bit about technology. I, I, I promised you that I would talk about some of the technology that's coming out of Africa. And I'm sorry if you can't see this as well as I would like. But one of the things that I want you to know about this picture is the need to unlearn what you think you know about disruptive tech. So this is an exponentially growing curve. It's no longer linear. And most of us who are here are involved with these technologies that are here. The internet, social, mobile, cloud, big data, analytics. But one of the things that we don't spend enough time thinking about is how these technologies are converging to actually create what is a new economic paradigm. So it's not enough for you to just be an expert in your area of technology. How is technology combining to create something that's really new? That even those of us who think we're smart and we know a lot, some of it we haven't seen before. So as I'm talking, I want you to be thinking about the future of work, the future of education, the future of transportation. How is this new economic paradigm that's emerging going to impact you as a person? That's one of the reasons why I'm always so glad to come to Campus Party, because Campus Party is about building bridges. It is really about preparing humanity for the impact of disruptive technologies. And I love the fact that when I come to campus party, it's not just for the rich people or the people who can afford a lot of money to go and hear experts talk. I see people here with their children. You're here all times of the day or night doing incredible things. That's why I flew 24 hours to come and be with you, because it's off the chain and I love it. So there's a new technological unemployment that's coming. Where are you in this picture? And is what you doing right now, is that enough to prepare you for this age that um, the US military has come up with a term called VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous? Are you prepared 
for the VUCA age. So I want you to, to be thinking about these things. This is not just a feel-good talk. So one way that you can think about what's happening with exponentially growing technology and why it's so disruptive, if you think, if you think here we are, this is an abacus. There's nothing happening in the computer age. And then all of a sudden, in the 70s, 80s, well, really in the 30s, we had a binary machine. But look at the rate of change, the rate of growth. It's vertical. So this slope here is very, very steep. And what happens is if I'm trying to predict where I'm going in the future based on the past, which is how we predict, it doesn't work because I'm over here. I'm not there. And so that's one of the reasons why this is such an unprecedented time in human history and why it's imperative for people like you to be thinking about how you're preparing yourself for that future. So don't be here, this guy. I didn't expect that, right? And one of the ways that we're gonna work it out is by building bridges, by staying together. I wouldn't be here on this stage if I didn't have a meta tribe of amazing people who support me and that I can talk to and who can help me to check myself. Because sometimes the success that we have, the thinking that has gotten us to where we are today, is the thinking that is gonna, it's gonna keep us from being where we need to be tomorrow because we can't predict anymore based on just what we've been doing in the past. So Africa, all right? I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and I want you to tell me if it is fact or fiction. All right? Are you ready? Are you awake? You with me? OK, this is a quiz. I'm going to see what you know about Africa. All right? So according to the National Association of Dealers Automated Quotation, which is NASDAQ, Two out of three of the fastest growing economies in the world today are located in Africa. True? Come on, play with me. True? False? Some people are just like not doing anything. That's not fair. <laughs> okay, so that's true. Those countries are Ghana, Ethiopia, and Uganda. All right? True or false? Africa is the fastest growing continent on Earth. Uh, the uh, World Bank expects Africa to have 1.5 billion people by 2030. True? True? False. Yeah, that one was true too. So Africa is not only the fastest growing continent on Earth, it is also the youngest continent on Earth. Africa has over 200 million people between the ages of 15 and 24. That's not hard to figure out where that's going, right? So Africa has more digital natives than any other continent, right? So one of the things that, I'll tell you a quick story. And then we'll move on. So years ago when I worked on Wall Street, one of the ways that I got to Africa in the first place is that I could see where the market was going. And I was like, we've got to invest in telecommunications in Africa. And my colleagues and who worked on Wall Street with me, they laughed at me. And you know what they said? They said, Africans are too poor to afford cell phones. Did you know that the continent that has the highest penetration of cell phone usage on, the con on, the, on planet Earth today is Africa. Africa has more cell phones per person than any other place on this planet. Okay? So one of the ways that I actually first made money was by investing in mobile communications licenses in Africa. And I haven't looked back. And all those friends who laughed at me and said, ha, 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 you're silly lady, going to Africa and taking your money, they're not laughing at me anymore. All right? <laughs> I'm just saying. All right? All right. 
Okay, let me give you a couple more because I really want you to understand that in order for us to get to where we need to be, we've got to unlearn some things. How many? Five minutes? Yeah. All right. I don't know where my time went. I mean, I think you guys are, you guys are jipping me out of my time. Come on now. Um, all right. So they said I only have five more minutes, and I want to get through to some of the people that I want you to see. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you any more Africa facts right now. I think you get the message. And the message is that Africa is actually rising. It's the youngest. It's the fastest growing. It has more cell phones per person than any place else on the planet. And don't believe what you read in the media about Africa. Because guess what? What I read in the media about Brazil is also not good. And if I just listened to the media, I wouldn't be here. Because all I hear about Brazil is something dangerous or some uh, politicians or some, you know, disease. But that's not Brazil. That's what somebody said about Brazil. So in order for us to get clear about one another, we've got to unlearn some stories that people have told us about each other. And we can do that by building better bridges. So let me give you a little taste of some of the folks that I, I play with in Africa. So this guy's name is Kojo Gniku. He's from Ghana. I love his, this guy. His company is W. Afet 3D Printers. Here is what I love about Kojo. He developed a 3D printer from waste that he collected from a dump. He built a 3D printer himself from waste. Then he entered into a competition uh, at NASA, really exploring how would you recycle waste in space. He won the competition. He had no money. He had no training. He just believed that he had the power to do something. And I think you've got that power too. This woman's name is Naomi Shifeta. She's at the University of Namibia. Uh, she's a doctoral candidate. She is leading the world in her research into how do you create bioplastics from seaweed. Now, one of the things that I know that you know is that plastic is killing us. It's killing our planet. So this young woman, who comes also from a very poor background. Not everybody I'm showing you comes from that kind of background, but I've, I've chosen some people who come from a really harsh background, and she is leading the world in bioplastics. Uh, this guy is Marlon Parker. So he created a whole ecosystem where if you are in the community and you are doing something great in your community, you earn a type of um, alternative currency. It's not Bitcoin, but you earn an alternative currency and you can spend that currency with vendors in your community. Very cool. So he's not out trying to flog his tokens. He's created a whole platform and a whole ecosystem where you, he's got the market for the tokens built into the social impact that he's doing. So this is Dr. Chao Mbogo. She's got a PhD in computer science. She is changing the world in terms of payment systems in Africa, and she's partnering with the likes of Google. If you looked at her and you saw her, would you think that this was a person who had a PhD in computer science? No, I know you wouldn't, but she does. And finally, um, this is Sean Edmiston. I chose Sean, he's not young. But South Africans, like Brazilians, come in all sizes, shapes, and colors. They're not just black, right? And so Sean was a banker, but he is developing um, a cutting edge med tech device that helps uh, general practitioners to completely get rid of paper. The other thing that he's doing that I really love is he's giving the patients back their right to access to medical information. 
So you can walk around with your medical information encrypted on your phone. You get into an accident, there's a problem. The, the general practitioner or the surgeon at the hospital can access that information without having to go through and figure out you know, who your doctor is. So if I'm here, it's on my phone. If I get into an accident or something happens, God forbid, you know how to deal with me because I've got my medical information with me in a way that's encrypted and that's safely stored and easily accessible across a, a, a whole host of languages. That's hot. And that's what Sean's doing. So I have to come quickly to closure. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I worked out an equation for you. I'm not going to go through it, but mo how many physicists do I have? Any physicists? OK, great. So um, I think my math is pretty good. And I went through, and the idea of this equation was to actually try to figure out how much power is stored in the human body. Because one of the things that I am after is power. And when I say power, I'm talking about the capacity to impact with purpose. And I believe we all have a lot of power to build amazing bridges. So this was my equation. The result is that the average human being, I, I chose a, a body that weighed about, uh, I think I said 78 or 80 kilograms, tried to split it between men and women. But my point is this. My point is that the average human being has in their body 88,000 times more power than the destructive bomb that destroyed the city of Nagasaki. You have within your body 88,000 times the amount of power that destroyed the city of Nagasaki. So what are you going to do with that power? Are you going to sit here at campus party and just be like spectators? Are you going to be actively involved with building bridges? What are you going to do with that power? I'm going to skip the video, and I'm going to come to a close. It's OK. Um, this is where we are today in terms of neuroscience. Uh, so you've got two guys that are here that are playing a video game, and it's uh, being driven by brain activity. It's not, they're, not, they're not doing anything else. They're just thinking, and the machine is responding. So we, we know that we're here today, right? All right. This is where we're going. But unless and until we get serious about hacking human consciousness, please don't try to connect with me that way. <laughs> I don't want you building a bridge to my brain unless your heart is in the right place. OK? All right. And so I think you get the point. Now, the last thing I wanted to show you was why I think this is important. This is a slum in San Francisco. This is right down the road from Silicon Valley. Any questions? The World Health Organization has determined that the slums of San Francisco are some of the filthiest in the world compared to favelas, whatever you name it, San Francisco has slums that are some of the filthiest in the world. So I want you to think about what is the responsibility of the tech billionaires who live in Silicon Valley to build better bridges to the people who are dwelling in the slums down the street? What good is technology that allows us to play video games based on my brain activity when I can't solve problems of people who are living on the street or under a bridge near my house? 
we don't have the luxury of just playing video games. We have got to build bridges to people who are in pain, people who are suffering. We have got to understand that we're in this together. The world is a sphere. This doesn't go away unless we begin to build better bridges. So this is what I'm all about. I use technology to make life better. I live in Africa because more than any place that I've been on planet Earth, Africans understand humanity. They don't have a lot, but they smile a lot. They have a little, but often they share what they have. That's what I'm talking about. Be in touch. You guys have been great. Thanks a bunch. Oh, I'm going to take some Q&A. Thank you. So do I have a few minutes for some Q&A? Yeah? Are we good? OK. So, so I love this image. I got to go back to my little, go back to my little boys. So what you think about what have I, what, you know, I've said a lot. I'm going to shut up now, and I'm going to listen. What do you think? What are you going to do? What are your questions that you have for me? It doesn't have to be a question. It could be an insight. The floor is yours. Hello. Hi. Hi. Eu gostaria de saber o que você poderia falar sobre as pessoas que ao mesmo tempo. Can you hear? Can you, can you all hear her? Yeah. Okay. Tá. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Eu gostaria que você falasse um pouquinho para as pessoas que, ao mesmo tempo que tem as pessoas que constroem as pontes, ao mesmo tempo tem as paralelas que constroem os muros. Como fazer para que essas pessoas que constroem muros destruam eles e transformem em pontes? Thank you. So. Ok. <laughs> Obrigado. <laughs> so, I think that was a great question. You know, I was born in North America, and I have to tell you, I am actually ashamed right now. That's the truth. I'm not going to come. I told you, I'm going to talk to you from the heart. I'm glad I live in Africa. I go back and I see people building walls. But you know what? It's not just America. There are lots of people who are building walls in Europe, right? There are lots of people who are building walls everywhere. Because what starts to happen is when we live and with too much of this, what starts to happen is fear. Fear starts to set in, and we start believing that there's not enough, that we've got to build walls because we've got to keep people out. We don't have enough jobs, so the foreigners have got to go, which is a lie because foreigners create jobs in your country. We all know that. So what's happening when people are building walls is It's, it's not logical, it's not rational, it's coming from a place of fear. Lack, greed comes from a place of fear. It comes from a place of believing that we don't have enough. But here is a myth that we're gonna bust. This planet was created such that every man, woman, and child 
on planet Earth today, there are enough resources for every, every man, woman, and child to live as if they were a millionaire. That's the truth. That is the truth of your birthright as a human being, as an earthling. There is no scarcity. There is no poverty. It's created, right? So you have to pay for water. You have to pay for food. You have to pay for all the things that the earth gives you for free because we've created economic systems that are based on scarcity. One of the great things about technology is that technology actually, given the connection between here and here and here and here, it has the capacity to actually unlock that poverty and to restore us to a place of abundance, which is our natural birthright. That's how God created us, to live in abundance. So why do we have this 1% of people on the planet controlling 80% of the wealth? That's not sustainable. And that's why I left Wall Street to go and live in Africa. So Mother Teresa said, I will not go to uh, an anti-war campaign, but you can invite me to a peace rally. So what I'm saying is that the way that we fight darkness is not to fight darkness, it's to turn on the light. So if we want to then have a response to people who want to build bridges, it's not about also engaging in fear-based activity and getting into a, a la luta. It is about establishing connections. It is about tapping into our humanity. The things that are gonna matter in the future are going to be your humanity, your capacity to learn, your capacity to think, your capacity to feel. The robots can do a lot, but they can never truly replicate our humanity. So the way that we deal with that is by building bridges, right? Anything else? Yep. Hey, nice to meet you. Hi. Well, you, what do you think, what we can do to help these people, what we can build a bridge to help this kind of people in this situation? So there is a tech billionaire, thank you for that question. There is a tech billionaire in Silicon Valley um, who lives in San Francisco, and he's going around and he's giving people $250,000 to do nothing, right? Because he wants to understand what are you gonna be like when we don't have these conditions. He's seeing a future where through technology we can create abundance. And, and what his experiment is trying to ascertain is how do you function when you don't have to get up and go to work every day? Do you create? Do you write poetry? Do you share? What do you do when you're no longer living in scarcity? So I think today, because I don't think we all have $250,000 to give to people to figure out how they're going to live. So I believe that today, one of the things that we can all do is we can figure out how we can leverage technology to actually make life better. I think that technology is a tool. It can be used to oppress people. It can be used to build walls. It can be used to create a class of people who don't know anything about technology and their life is going to be worse because those of us who do know a lot about technology are going like this and then they're going like that. And that's not good for anybody. So what we've got to do is we've got to figure out what are the systemic problems that are creating this. And it's complicated. And it's difficult, and the heart is really hard, but we've got to do it. What is the economic and financial systems that is creating this? 
What are we doing that's creating this? And how then do we begin to live better and do better? But I think the first step is in asking the question. Okay? Thank you. I think I have time for one more. Okay, we've got a lady here. Boa noite. Oi. É, nós estamos falando sobre conectividade e pontes, né? Qual seria qual seria a forma de fazer uma ponte em questão é, educacional? O que podemos fazer Brasil África com relação a com relação à África Brasil em questão de de construir pontes e, e buscar tecnologia lá. Sabemos que a África do Sul realmente é um país bem rico. E o pouco que nós sabemos é sobre a África do, Bra oh, sobre a África do Sul. É, e o resto da África a gente não conhece muito aqui no Brasil. O que podemos fazer para fazer essa ponte Brasil-África? África num total, não só a África do Sul. Ok. So, um, thank you for your question. Um, you mentioned education. So, one of the things that we are doing, my Center for Disruptive Technologies, which at some point I want to build a bridge to Brazil because I think it's going to be interesting to see how we do it here. So, we're building a platform and we've got um, 400 schools that have signed up to be on our platform. And our platform is about STEAM. Um, it's, it's not just STEM, it's science, technology, engineering, and math, and we added the arts and humanities. You saw those beautiful bridges. They don't get there without the arts and humanities and the designers, right? So, so the, the arts and humanities are very important. And so what, we, what we've done is we have developed a technology platform that makes enhanced STEM learning accessible. I can't be, you can't be at every school out there teaching. So what we've done is we've created a platform that actually um, includes adaptive learning and micro learning. So we've included strong AI components that are actually helping teachers to understand how the students are learning. So the iterative process for the students learning is very quick because the AI is learning how I learn. And that's going crazy. So that's something that I love to continue to share information about. And so that's one of the ways that we're dealing with building bridges to those learners in communities who will never get an opportunity to go to Singularity University, right? So, but you've asked another question that has to do with the bridges between Africa and uh, Brazil and South Africa and Brazil. One of the reasons why I was so irritated at this BRICS conference that we just had in South Africa is because uh, we haven't thought enough about how do we leverage the existing fora. So we've got the new development bank, which is supposed to be investing in development. Now I define development as making life better. If it's not about making life better, then it's not development. And so, we should be lobbying the BRICS bank, the new development bank to say, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, they're all members of this bank. But what are the mechanisms that allow us to get together, collaborate, and then have these ideas, these co-creations funded, right? And so one of the things that my center is doing and that I would encourage all of you to do is before we go out, and we create something new, we look at the Afro-Brazilian fora that exists because there's a lot of them. People are being paid to do this work. We should make them work for us. Is that okay? Right. And we should also um, leverage the internet to do that. So I, I will put my information back up I'm certainly doing all that I can, but what we're doing as a center isn't enough. You have to also 
be asking questions and doing and exploring, okay? Because there's a lot of information that's available if you have a mind and a heart to look for it. So get on the internet, do some searches, figure out what's happening in the world, look beyond Rondonia, Puerto Veo, or Sao Paulo, and say, I'm in MedTech. She mentioned Sean, he's involved in MedTech. Brazil, a lot of your GDP is in MedTech. How can I partner with him? Where is he? Oh, let me Google him. Let me look on LinkedIn. It just takes a little bit of will, and you can do it. You have the power. You know, you just saw that you have the power. Okay, is that it? No? One more? Okay, got one more. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you because I truly believe... I can't hear you. Come over okay, here. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, Hi. Hi. Do I need this? English or Portuguese? Okay, English. Okay. English. And thank you because I truly believe you are being an uh, inspiration for all of us uh, tonight. So, um, I think you are saying is everything about change our mindset. So in Brazil, we have a problem if our examples and principle in our, in our politicians' examples. So how to do to change our mindset in this establishment, in this scenario? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. It's not enough to say how, you know, to just unlearn something or change your mindset. He used the example of politics. How do you change your mindset? So we've spent a lot of time, so we advise big companies, governments about their disruptive innovation strategies, and we spend a lot of time thinking about that question. How do you change your mindset? And you know what? It's not easy. The question that you've asked is a difficult one. It's actually really not easy to change your mindset. We are a combination of culture, of education. What is culture anyway? Our language, the way we walk, the way we eat, the way we talk. Our, our, our beings have been formed by people who are close to us, who love us, who tell us things. It's formed by our religious ideas. These things don't change overnight. So you don't wake up and you go out the next day and you look at a woman who's walking down the road who looks like me and you think, wow, she could be doctor like Dr. McPherson or she could be at NASA or she could do this. You have a pre-programmed response. It's the same way with respect to politicians or the economy or technology. And so unlearning behavior is a difficult thing to do. It starts with being aware. So part of what I've done tonight is just try to raise your level of awareness that these things exist. And then what you actually have to do is you have to decide in your heart that you want to have more power or you want to be different. And then it's like going to the gym. I love to eat chocolate cake. It is my favorite. I'm addicted to chocolate. But, you know, I also like to wear tight dresses. So I have a choice. <laughs> I eat the chocolate, then I go to the gym. And it's the same thing for your brain. Your brain is a muscle. It can be trained just like your body. You have a choice. What you put into your brain and how you rewire yourself and unlearn is like going to the gym. So do yourselves a favor. When you leave this talk, and this is the last thing I'm gonna say, just walk around campus party, asking yourself, what do you think about the people that you see? And it's very interesting, because you never know who you're talking to here. You make assumptions about people, but you don't know who they are. So just for one day, try to be aware of your own thinking just about this experience. Get out of yourself, build a bridge, talk to somebody that you wouldn't talk to. Say hello to somebody that you wouldn't normally speak to. 
Try to find out what somebody is doing. Maybe you don't know what they're doing. Don't be afraid. Why don't you just ask? Just for the time that you're at campus party, challenge yourself to be different. It's scary. It's difficult. You don't know. Maybe the person's going to be rude. But this is an opportunity. And the things that we do today, the choices that we make today determine our future. So you've got the power. Make it happen. Cheers.